Human beings live in territories, so how is it possible to have non-territorial autonomy? To clarify the issue and show the validity of the term, we need to explore schematically how human beings are governed and why territory became a significant part of that. Towards the end of the Middle Ages in Europe, people lived in autocratic empires. These were governed by autocratic kings and nobles. Most people in this period were obliged in one way or another to be loyal to a sovereign and normally had no say in the ways they were governed. Loyalty to the sovereign did not entail any form of cultural equality, and even less so, a cultural identity with the ruler. In fact, most medieval sovereigns would have been offended if they were told that they shared a cultural identity with plebeians. Consequently, in medieval autocratic and authoritarian systems of governance, cultural identity was irrelevant to the process of governance. But then modernity followed with its democratic revolutions. First, the borders of European states were clearly established. The Peace of Westphalia in 1648 ended the Thirty Years' War and defined the original principles of modern international relations, including the inviolability of borders and non-interference in the domestic affairs of sovereign states. What is crucially important for our argument, it created the territorial basis for the system of nation-states. Hey, just a moment. Europe is not the whole world. There are far more peoples and countries outside Europe. Correct. But in whatever way you see it, for better or worse, through colonialism, imperialism, and other means, the European model of the nation-state became dominant outside Europe, particularly in post-colonial countries. So the governance of the post-Westphalian nation-state system is our point of departure for the development of non-territorial autonomy for two reasons. First, while there is no consensus as to what a nation is, all contrasting definitions confirm that a nation is some kind of cultural community. As a cultural community, a nation shows similarities to an ethnic group, a group of people who identify with each other by their common attributes, such as common traditions, occasionally ancestry, language, history, and culture. The result of this is that cultural identity becomes, for the first time, a central ingredient of the system of governance. Second, the French Revolution incorporated representative democracy as a key ingredient of the nation-state. Sure, not all nation-states exercise representative democracy, but most do claim to do that. In its democratic and non-democratic forms, the nation-state stimulates cultural cohesion by educating and encouraging its citizens to adhere to the nation-state culture. How many states exist in the world? Easy. 193 states are represented in the United Nations, and the vast majority define themselves as nation-states. The United Nations should be more precisely called the United States, except that that name is under copyright. Now, how many nations exist in the world? The answer is difficult. It depends on how nations are defined. James B. Minahan, in his monumental two-volume book, Encyclopedia of Stateless Nations, counts and describes many thousands. But one thing is undisputed. There are far more stateless nations than nations with states. And almost all these nations, with or without a state, territorially overlap with other nations. Nations and states are different things. A nation-state is the idea of a homogeneous nation governed by its own sovereign state, when each state contains one nation. This ideal is hardly ever achieved, and yet most states continue to call themselves nation-states. In some cases, in the post-colonial world, new states engage in the process of ethnogenesis, the creation of a new national community from a medley of different groups. In fact, the French Revolution did exactly that, it pursued policies that eradicated other languages spoken in France. Nevertheless, often minority communities do not wish to lose their language and culture. Yet in many cases, even in representative democracies, for numerical reasons it's not possible for national minorities to resist assimilation. Nor can they legislate to protect their culture or way of life. Worse, sometimes minorities are discriminated against and considered alien even if they've lived in their territories for generations. It's not an exaggeration to say that this is the cause of some of the most protracted and bloody conflicts in the world. So, here we have the problem that non-territorial autonomy wishes to resolve. 
In representative democracies, the idea of one person, one vote is considered the most equitable and democratic means to secure equal representation. But is it? It could certainly work well when the body of citizens is culturally homogeneous. But this is not the case in most states represented in the United Nations. Precisely because one person, one vote is a numerical approach, in parliamentary democracies, minorities, by virtue of their numbers, cannot get legislation to protect their culture and way of life without consent of the dominant nation. Here then, non-territorial autonomy emerges as a way to enhance representative democracy and create a state environment inclusive of ethnic and national minorities, so that these minorities feel included in the state in which they reside and do not struggle for secession, which is without doubt the most significant cause of bloody internal wars. Autonomy is often understood as a regional form of self-governance within a state. But here we face a second problem. In a significant number of cases, minorities do not reside in compact areas. Instead, they are scattered in different parts of the territory, making them to be also territorial minorities. Here, territorial autonomy will not work, so the modality of non-territorial autonomy is more suited to achieve genuine community representation. And, as such, it is an enhancement of representative democracy. So, we go back to the initial issue. Yes, everyone lives in territories. But territorial representation is not suited for minorities that share territory with others. Hence, we need a form of minority representation that is not based on territory. This is non-territorial autonomy. So, how exactly does it work? Here we reach another point that requires some explanation. Non-territorial autonomy is not a single form of minority representation, but a variety of different forms that emerge independently in different places and in different periods. Non-territorial autonomy is a generic term that refers to diverse practices of minority community empowerment and self-determination that does not entail exclusive control over territory. Why so? Simply because, with the emergence of the nation-state, the problem of dispersed minority representation to avoid secession became urgent in different parts of the world, in different periods, and in different circumstances. What all non-territorial autonomy practices have in common is a challenge to the idea that national self-determination and national governance can exclusively take place in the form of territorial representation or as a sovereign territorial state. Of course, all forms of community autonomy occur in a territory. But the specific difference of non-territorial autonomy is that it does not claim exclusive sovereign control over a specific territory that minorities often shared with others. It seeks to represent a cultural segment of the population that resides in a territory without undermining the rights of others. Finally, a few brief examples. There are many more. First, consociationalism. This is one of the most commonly used forms of non-territorial autonomy, applied in states that have major ethnic, religious, or linguistic conflicts. It is a bottom-down form of non-territorial autonomy, because governance is through formal consultation among the leaders of the various groups, which often have veto power. The goal of consociationalism is governmental stability through power-sharing arrangements. It has been applied in a few countries, one of the most recent examples is Northern Ireland. It has been criticized for being too elite-oriented. Second, national cultural autonomy. This model was developed by the Austrian socialists Otto Bauer and Karl Renner around the turn of the 20th century, with the aim of preventing the disintegration of the Austrian Empire by creating a two-tier system of governance, one national and non-territorial, and the other territorial but non-national. The idea was to allow democratic representation of all national communities by organizing nations as non-territorial bodies because of the considerable territorial overlap of most national communities. It was adopted by the anti-Zionist Jewish Bund, the Armenian Social Democrats, the Russian Constitutional Democratic Party, or cadets, the Ottoman Greek Socialist Workers Federation of Thessaloniki, by those who favor a binational solution in Palestine, and by the Democratic Union of Hungarians in Romania after 1989. It was also implemented by the Ukrainian People's Republic in 1917 and by Estonia in the 1920s. 
Since the collapse of the Soviet system, significant variants of the original model were implemented in Lithuania in 1989, in Latvia in 1991, in Ukraine in 1992, in Estonia and Hungary in 1993, and in the Russian Federation's Law of National Cultural Autonomy in 1996. Third, indigenous peoples. Indigenous peoples were made into minorities in their own countries mainly by colonialism. While the restitution of their sovereign land is no longer possible, they have developed forms of self-determination that take the form of non-territorial autonomy. In Scandinavian countries, the Sami peoples developed a form of self-governance with their respective states. The Sami parliaments are forms of non-territorial autonomy. They exist in areas where there is a non-Sami majority, and the mechanism for their elections are non-territorial, but rather sourced from electoral lists of members of the Sami, regardless of their place of residence. Likewise, in Latin America, an interesting example is the plurinational state of Bolivia. Latin American indigenous movements and the new constitutional arrangements in Bolivia speak of plurinationalism in formulating demands for indigenous communities' rights and for the transformation of what is thus far a nation-state into a multi-nation state with modalities of non-territorial autonomy, granting collective rights to the commonwealth of many indigenous communities that inhabit it. The result of this creative modality of non-territorial autonomy is that indigenous self-determination is not building separate entities set apart from the rest of society. On the contrary, the call is for multi-level governance, allowing for a degree of indigenous self-determination, but also participation in state-sanctioned systems of governance. In other words, the indigenous movements seek not just separation, but also inclusion. Fourth, the promising Rojava experiment. The autonomous administration of North and East Syria, also known by its Kurdish name Rojava, is one of the most interesting and thought-provoking examples of contemporary non-territorial autonomy. This is because it combines community representation with gender representation, enhancing the role of women in minority communities. The area of Northeast Syria is one that contains many different ethnic communities, including among others, Kurds, Arabs, Turkmen, Assyrians, Armenians, and Chechen. All communities in the area elect their representatives in a community electoral role, and the representatives of each community must include an equal number of men and women. In conclusion, non-territorial autonomy resolves a recurrent democratic deficit of representative democracies. It is important to note that models of non-territorial autonomy are continuously evolving in different forms and shapes because of the recurrent deficit of minority representation in contemporary nation states and because they are an important tool for the effective participation of minorities in public life, as advocated by the Lund recommendations. To learn more about non-territorial autonomy and cultural diversity management, visit our website at inton.org.